Hello and welcome to our lectionary study for this first Sunday in, in Lent, um, where we're going to look at the, the epistle reading appointed for our readings in the three-year series, and where we're going through, um, right now, James chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. And this is one of these marvelous New Testament texts. Um, I don't know how often you read through the book of James, but James is um, almost like a New Testament wisdom piece, um, similar to the book of Ecclesiastes or Proverbs from the Old Testament. And, and as we take a look at it, James here in this chapter basically talks about not only how we deal with struggles and trials, but the other side is, is he digs it far deeper than just um, this sense of, of um, you know, just, just you know, dig deep and buck up and those sorts of things, but um, actually ties it to the, the chain and, and the working, the psychology, if you want to, um, what to call it, the psychology of temptation and of evil within our own hearts. And so as we begin, um, and this is a beautiful text for us to reflect on in conjunction with Sunday's Gospel reading, where beginning Lent, we hear that call to return to the Lord, that repent and believe the Gospel. Um, it's a beautiful verse to, to tie together with that, because it's all intertwined. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you that through your Son you have done all things well in order to work out our salvation Help us as we reflect upon these words of Scripture, not only today, but throughout your word, um, to be able to recognize not only what your call is for our lives and how far we stumble from it, not only externally, but even internally inside of our hearts, um, so that we would be able to, to turn to Christ time and time again as the, the one, the only who died for us to win that forgiveness and to bring us to heaven. Bless us within that gift of faith and awareness so that we would always be able to turn to him. All these things we pray in the name of your Son, our Savior. Amen. All right. And you hear Errol tinkling around, and that's he's, he's playing soccer with his little tennis balls right now. So as we go through this, um, the James passage is a marvelous one, and it um, ties also into our context here today. Um, wrestling through COVID, and everybody wrestles with it differently. Some people are just fine with it out there, and other people, um, we, we're, we're saddled and riddled with worries, where I know some people, they, they haven't gone out of the house for anything meaningful, even um, for, for, you know, months at this point in time. And it's not to, not to bruise anybody's conscience along the way, but learning to put our trust during these kinds of trials into... Uh, into God's care for us um, becomes one of these these challenging things. Mm. And uh, as we listen and as we go through this um, particular passage, um, James here reminds us that even during those times where we are struggling both with our sins or the weight of sin within the world, however it hits us, um, that that we are called to remain steadfast. In other words, um, you know, firmly planted where... Well, in the gift that God provides in Christ Jesus. And so often, and I know this this goes counter to the way in which our society teaches us to think, you know, when you're wrestling and struggling through something, you're taught to dig deep and you find it within yourself in order to do these kinds of things. And sometimes we're able to do that because there is a certain resilience to our character. After all, we are created in the image of God. But ultimately, when it comes to spiritual things, which digs to the very bottom and the very base of our existence, um, we, we discover along the way that even our own self-made ways of digging deep um, fall apart. And, and as a result, and this is where James goes with this, is that we need to go back to the very source of our life, to the gifts of God, to the working of God, which comes to us specifically in what Jesus has done and it's a beautiful text to reflect on right at the beginning here of our Lenten season, because as we walk with Jesus through this Lenten season, basically we're observing all the things that he has done and continues to do and has brought us into so that through the waters of baptism, we are made participate, uh, participants. We participate in the fullness of everything that he's done for us so that it becomes ours, not by our good works or good looks, because, um, you know, if that's the case, you know, we'd have to all stay in our 20s or whatever it might be. But no, it's based on what Christ has done perfectly for us. And the way that we reflected on Sunday, not only his baptism for repentance, our repentance is always incomplete. Christ perfects it. 
but then also in the way in which he went out into the wilderness in order to do that battle with the devil, um, with Satan himself, and he won. And so through baptism being tucked away and hidden in Christ, we benefit from that. Now, recognizing all of this, that we're already planted in Christ, what does that mean for us? Well, it means that, first of all, we're already planted by those, those, those waters of, uh, you know, the, the, the living streams, by the, the waters from Psalm 1. Um, we're already planted in the reality of that completed work of Christ. And the challenge for us as a result is, as we take a look at the way in which we live out our internal struggles, that spiritual battle, um, that, that's waged not only outside in the world, but also within our, thought, our hearts, our thoughts, our minds, our feelings, um, that we, we um, build on that, not looking at it as though this is something I got to do in order to get there, but instead um, recognizing all of these different movements and motions, the way in which it drives us nuts on the inside. And some days we're great, some days we're just a mess. Um, that, that, you know what, the good Lord has already worked out the details. And so learning to let go of the things, that's part of the sense of repentance, let go of the things that stand in the way so that we can rest in, not necessarily embrace, but rest in, um, what Christ has already done and given, um, becomes one of these, these deeper spiritual things that we, we need to practice more and more. So here, beginning with verse 12, James chapter 1. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Okay, so the gift is already promised, and we wait for the fulfillment of it for when Jesus comes again. But here, the whole problem is, is that during times of trial, and Luther used that word um, unfechtungen or tentatio from the Latin trials, struggles that arise not only because of actual sin and the realization of actual sin within our lives, but also just the trials and struggles of, of um, being able to, to rest in the peace of Christ, which is, um, you know, this, this continuous struggle that we all have. Um, basically, here, James begins pointing out that those trials... Um, whether they come from outside or whether they come from inside, from the devil, the world, or our sinful flesh, they do have the power to distract us and pull us away from that, not only the calm and the peace, the tranquility that comes from Christ, but also potentially also knock us off of um, and out of that gift of salvation so that we end up chasing after other things for our peace. And so here, basically, James begins this particular passage pointing out that, you know, we are truly blessed if we are able to withstand those trials and remain steadfast in what God has given and promised. And this becomes not only a very important thing for, you know, us as we take a look at our own spiritual lives, for us as a congregation, so that, you know, rather than um, nursing, nursing and festering um, things that we can argue about and rage about, and then that rage drives us nuts. Um, the same thing as we're, we're raising our, our children. Um, rather than teaching them to, to um, you know, uh, well, teaching them how to deal with those, those trials in a way that always leads them and brings them back so that they remain anchored in Christ in that gift that has been given to us in baptism becomes that very important um, thing that we're called upon to, to nurture within our kids. So verse 13, James goes on, he says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Um, very important verse, ver, verse, verse um, as, as we hear this, because James is pointing out, you know, you can't blame God for the crazy stuff in our lives, even though he may allow it. And we have passages of scripture which point to the simple fact that he does allow different things to happen all according to his time throughout history. The book of Job is a beautiful one to reflect upon that. But God is not the source of these things. It is our own brokenness and the brokenness and the sinfulness of the world. And so um, we can't blame God for the evils that exist in the world, even though, um, you, know, you know, the temptation is always there. And as we look at that, it's a very important um, verse to remind us we're going to face trials. 
we can't say that they come from God in, or in the sense that God is tempting us away from him. But at the same time, as we take a look at this, we're reminded that, that um, you know, as, as we look at what God's work is, it is always that gift of working peace, restoring, reuniting us through Christ, by the working of the Holy Spirit, in and through the word, in and through the sacraments, um, in order to keep us firmly planted in that gift of grace. And, and this is where James goes by the time we get to the end of the passage in his own, in, in his own way of, of writing here. So verse 14 he points out, so instead of blaming God for our temptations, where do these things come from? And we'll be reminded of Jesus, well, out of the heart come all of these evil desires. It's not what comes into the body that makes us unclean, but what comes out of the heart. Um, the way Jesus was explaining to the disciples after, you know, there's, and we so often get... Um, get ourselves turned around on that and this goes directly against this whole this whole modern day uh, thing just follow your heart your heart won't lead you wrong well no it will um uh, you know this this sense that we're somehow innately good um w within our own impulses and our desires well no um you know we're good by god's good gift of creation but that's been distorted so that you know we can't just trust what comes out of our heart. We need God's word to guide us. Here, James builds on that, and the way he puts it is. So rather than blaming God when we're tempted, he says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Um, here he's linking these chains, and he's pointing out that um, the way that our brokenness, our sinfulness works is, is that there is this, this internal chain of how these things are connected. And it starts right with the core of our being with the way that our desires uh, all of a sudden, you know, come out of there. And it's not all of a sudden, they're always there. If you take the time to, to sit reflectively, um, we'll discover how they show up. Sometimes if we sit quietly for a moment just to reflect on God's word, sometimes we'll get bored. Sometimes we'll get greedy and say, I really should be doing this instead. Sometimes we get angry and we say, I'm discovering things in there that I'm not happy about. Um, sometimes we get, um, you know, just just complacent or upset with with all kinds of things. We'll find all kinds of stuff lingering underneath. Anger, greed, avarice, boredom, you know, pridefulness, all of these sorts of things where we sit down and say, we, you know, even I'm, this is stupid. I don't need to do this. Um, interesting that we would react that way because, well, you take it back to the Garden of Eden, you know, did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat from? Um, you know, the answer was, in a certain sense, this is stupid. I don't need to go through this inquisition. It's the woman that you gave to me, blaming God. The woman saying, well, the serpent made me do this, and all these sorts of things, rather than simply saying, yeah, it's there. And the good Lord wants to deal with that. So each person is tempted when we're lured and enticed by our own desires. Our desires are the inner restlessness in our hearts. You know, using Luther's commentary from Ecclesiastes, since I'm working through that right now as well. That inner restlessness from our hearts that leads us to always want to not sit where we are and wait on the Lord, or to rest in the blessing that he has given so that we are, are, are all of a sudden um, transformed through that gift. But instead, um, we, we always look to try and fill that, that restlessness with something different. And sometimes, you know, it's pretty benign things in the world. I need a chocolate bar. I really want a chocolate bar. I'm looking for a snack. That's my favorite ice cream, you know, those sorts of things. Sometimes it turns into vices with drug fixes or overuse of alcohol, um, smoking and these sorts of things. And then depending on what you like to smoke, then you can get into all kinds of other areas where we're looking for something or someone else to give us that peace rather than looking to Christ. Our desire leads us away from being able to be present with ourselves and with God in the moment. And then desire, when it is conceived, in other words, once it starts there and it grows from there, it gives birth to sins, so our thoughts, 
our worries, our anxieties, good, you know, you know, self-justifying thoughts, um, all these sorts of things um, where, where, we, where we say, well, this wouldn't be so bad. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're led along the way with those thoughts and desires. So that leads to sin in our thoughts, in our emotions, and then eventually, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Well, it leads the thoughts into our hands, into our actions, what we what we consume with our eyes, with our ears, with our mouth, you know, all sorts of different things. And then eventually brings forth death, while well, the wages of sin is death, or right back to Genesis, um, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, where they told you not to eat from, you will surely die. Um, that death um, refers not only to our physical death, but also spiritual death. Um, here, beautiful, beautiful unfolding of that. And learning to be aware of that, and this becomes important from James, as we take a look and as we wrestle through this, this call to return to the Lord, um, what do we need to let go? Well, these desires, and even though they're going to be present, um, and then they learn you know, that they would love to have us along the way grab a hold of them so that they fill more and more of our thought and our obsessions and, and shape the way in which we live our lives. Um, basically, James is saying, you know, sin has its roots within us. And rather than letting that lead us astray so that under trials and temptations um, that, that we get get drawn around by the nose you know um good image from leading a leading an ox with the, the ring in its nose um that that we remain steadfast in what's been given from god our heavenly father in christ okay brief introduction to what james is talking about verse 16 saying since this is the case with how you know, sin has its way of percolating inside of us. Do not be deceived, my brothers. Okay, so don't start thinking that that, the mess inside, is from God. You can't blame him for it. Don't be deceived. Instead, he says, verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So in other words, every good gift, okay, forgiveness, grace, love, Jesus, you know, the, the peace that passes all understanding, the transforming work of the Holy Spirit, it comes not from inside of us, it comes from the Father, from outside of us. It comes down, and with our Heavenly Father, there isn't variation, he says, <coughs> or shadow due to change. In other words, there's no... Um, if you, if you have ever studied Jung, there's the shadow side to everybody's personality that he talks about. Well, God doesn't have a shadow side, okay? Um, there is no shadow, and basically God is not, you know, capricious in the sense as one day he says this, the next day he says that, and all these sorts of things along the way. Um, you know, God is constant in not only his word about who we are called to be according to creation, that's the law, but then also, and more importantly, through Christ by redemption, by the work that he has done for us, and then the working of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit is given in order to help um, help keep us you know, steadfast, planted in that gift of grace. Um, we can trust God's word and God's gift. And so verse 18, he says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Um, Jesus also being the word made flesh. Basically, he has brought us forth by Christ, through whom all things were made, creation, but also in whom through the waters of baptism, by his incarnation, all these things that we've been talking about, um, that we have been joined to, you know, the, the Godhead um, in Christ through baptism, by grace, um, so that, you know, as we listen to these things, it goes on to say that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Here, in a nutshell, what James does is, is he says, sin is around us, and it's even inside of you. Um, that's why we confess our sins. 
that's why that word repentance, return to the Lord, is always there throughout not only scriptures, but then the way we use it in our liturgies. It is there as that perfect reminder that um, from, from our Heavenly Father that as we take a look at our lives, we shouldn't be surprised when these things show up. And we shouldn't be destroyed or weighed down when we discover that they are there. Simply be aware, James says, that there is a process to how that unfolds. And we can observe that when we watch ourselves and our our own, um, you know, way that we, we get caught up with, you know, there I'm doing that thing again and then we kick ourselves. Um, but the point is, is not to say to stay with kicking ourselves, but as, you know, our Lenten season teaches us, um, return to the Lord and say, Lord, have mercy. Make the sign of the cross. Remember, you have been baptized. Um, baptismus sum, the Latin term, the Latin phrase. So that as we build not on our own feeble attempts to beat down sin, which really is just a matter of, you know, controlling one piece of life where the rest is going crazy and then all of a sudden this side and then we end up, you know, driving ourselves nuts, that we realize that Jesus has done it all. He has finished it all. He has given his grace. He continues to give his grace. And that's why church attendance and baptism, you know, it's not just a matter of I brought my kids to be done and now I can go and sit at home and, 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 and ignore, you know, faith issues throughout the rest of my life. No, not at all. It's a matter of saying now that I've been planted in there and the Holy Spirit is working within my life and wants to work within my life more and more, um, that that we come being drawn by the Holy Spirit and we bring our children, the same thing, being drawn by the Holy Spirit so that they learn that rhythm of confession and forgiveness, being drawn and brought back to Christ, learning to deal with the, the trials that, that we all carry and all face, each in our own ways, in a way that is godly rather than in a way that pushes us down, one which is honest, where we recognize and confess our sins and confess that those things are very much present within our lives, but then also rejoice in the simple fact that God himself, in the person of Jesus, has already fixed all of these things and has planted us in us so that we have not only the open door to heaven, but we have that very present gift of his help when we face the trials even today. Of his own word, that's Jesus, the words of scripture as well, the word made flesh, we have... And this is where some of these early church writers say when we handle the scriptures, we handle Christ. Um, we have already that gift, that perfect gift, which can displace and does displace all of these other things so that as we continue to wrestle with that brokenness that we carry around, all until this side of eternity is wrapped up and we are ushered into the fullness of that blessing and that gift in heaven. Um that, you know, our call to remain steadfast comes not by our own strength, but instead through the work of Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit, so that as we take a look at what this repentance and, you know, what are you giving up for Lent kind of talk that we get into this time of year, we're reminded that it's not a matter of you trying harder to reform yourself, to make yourself impressive to God, but it's exact opposite, letting go of all of the things where we try to control our own existence, recognizing that that's as much steeped in the problem of sin, our brokenness, and resting in Christ in order to allow the Holy Spirit to work out the details and to give us strength, hope, courage, and fill us with his mercy, life, and love so that that can spill over into all the other areas of our lives. Sometimes that's a scary thing. Because, you know, I don't know about you, but I know um, for many people we're raised to control everything so that people see not what's really going on, but what we want them to see. Um, you can't do that with the good Lord. Um, that's why, you know, as we take a look at it, it's a foolhardy mission when we try to do that. Um, but our desire always to control really is to try and control our old self, our old Adam, rather than allowing the Lord to work something new. Um, and so as we look at all of this, Lent really is a season of renewal. 
letting go, recognizing the crazy stuff, not allowing it to, to grow into that sin in our thoughts and our minds, but instead mm -hmm. to say, when you see it, Lord, have mercy. And then running to the places where Christ has promised to forgive us. So in baptism, I am baptized. Um, in the words of forgiveness that, you know, pastors by the Christ's command get to speak in these words are as true on earth as they are in heaven, according to Jesus' own words, um, where we get to say your sins are forgiven for the sake of Christ. Um, but then also when we get to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and we're getting back to that again in our limited capacity, limited opening, um, where Jesus gives us the very fruit of the cross, his very own body and blood, um, you know, in order to give us forgiveness and life. And what a wonderful gift it is. Keep that all in mind. Lent is a season of renewal, and it's our blessing to be able to walk through it. Amen. All right, we'll see you all um, when we see you, and um, the Lord be with you as we, we keep walking through this Lenten journey here. Amen.